Welcome to this um, first external policy chat uh, that we're organizing, and this was really the brainchild of, of Samuele and Sofia, uh, based on some discussions that we had um, uh, several months ago, actually, last year, uh, some of these discussions started, uh, really exploring how uh, the manipulation of food culture impacts food system policy. Um, my name is Anand. Uh, I am a researcher based out of the University of Heidelberg at the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health. Uh, and we are coordinating the FEAST project, uh, which I'll give you a bit of background on. Um, our aim in the FEAST project, uh, in very simple terms, is to make it easy for every person in Europe to eat a delicious, healthier, more sustainable diet. So the three kind of nuances around that statement. First, when we say easy, um, we want to have an equal opportunity for every person in Europe. So not just European citizens, but every person. Um, and when we say easy, uh, we're not talking just about behavior change, but the opportunity and the access to healthy, more sustainable, delicious food, uh, and looking at the affordability aspects as well. And when we say delicious, healthier, and more sustainable, um, what we're looking at here is not the expectation that everybody becomes a vegan overnight, but that we go through this gradual transition process so that uh, people can uh, gradually uh, uh, accommodate different types of cuisine, different types of ingredients, etc. And this is where this webinar on food culture, I think, is, is so important. Um, one of our kind of starting principles in FEAST is that our current European food systems um, are very lopsided. Um, if we look at people, we're looking at the public sector, we're looking at the environment, all three are losing. Uh, people are losing because of diet-related illness. Um, uh, the public sector is losing because of the amount of money that we have to spend on diet-related illnesses, which equates to about 700 billion euros per annum across uh, the EU. And the cost of overweight and obesity, for example, uh, obviously, which has really strong links to, to diet, is expected to double uh, by 2035. And the environment is also losing as well. And the only real winners are the large, large multinationals who are, you know, uh, making a lot of money off the processed food sales, soft drinks and fast food. Um, in Feast, we don't want anybody to lose. So what we're not saying is that the, the multinationals should yeah. lose, but what we are saying is that they shouldn't be winning at the expense of all the other stakeholders in the food system. And what we're trying to explore in FEAST um, is looking at the micro, meso, and macro levels of our food systems to try to understand the barriers as well as the facilitators, and probably most importantly, the facilitators. So what we want to try to avoid is just whining all the time uh, and saying that this is wrong and that's wrong uh, um, and it's unfair, etc. But really try to focus on solutions at the micro, meso and macro level. So the micro level will be looking at individuals and, and households. The meso level would be looking at communities and food environments. And the macro level is looking at the policy dimensions. Um, this is our consortium. I think we have a really awesome consortium. Uh, we represent 15 uh, countries in Europe, uh, 35 partners, and we have 13 living labs. Um, and it's a very vibrant and, and dynamic atmosphere. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Samuele, uh, who is going to talk about this uh, policy chat. Thank you so much, Anand. And uh, yeah, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Samuele Tonello and I'm a research coordinator at EuroHealthNet. Uh, we, EuroHealthNet is a European partnership that works in public health. And we work especially on the social determinants of health and health inequalities. And this is why also uh, working on food system is an important part of our work. And uh, in FIST, we are um, the leaders of the work package for the focus is on policy together with the Roskilde University that are the co-lead of our work package. And so since I know that there's um, many of you today and uh, some may be uh, familiar with what uh, an European project does with some a bit uh, less, I just wanted to give it a bit of overview of what um, policy means, what, what a policy work package does in this project and why actually we are doing this policy chat uh, webinar and why we are doing it public today. So as you can see from this very scientific infographic, it's uh, policy means really trying to connect the research part 
to the policy making. And so in a way we are trying to create a bridge. And uh, here this bridge, it's in a way we are trying to maximize the impact of this, of this project. Impact means that we want to uh, make sure that the policy making, the policy process reflects what we are, we are doing in the process. And here, a bit oversimplifying, we have two main roles. And in a way, towards the policy making, we are a bit as uh, the merchant role. So we have um, our academic partners, our universities that are doing this really great job in research and in other aspects. And we really want to show how good these results are. And so we try to show the policy makers the, the quality of these results. So we produce policy brief, we have policy dialogues, we have these meetings where we really try to show the importance of, of this. So this is the part a little bit of the of the merchant. But then on the other side, we also act a bit as uh, I said here as a counselor. So we also want to support the research partners and we want to make sure that their research is developed according to also what is uh, happening at the, at the policy level, especially at European level, but then national and, uh, and regional as well. So we try to connect these two parts and we really, really um, to maximize again the, the impact of, of our work. And for us, especially here, as you, as you heard from Anand now, we, our goal is really that we want a healthier and more sustainable food system. And so I know that many of you are, are experts in this field and it, they probably now thinking, well, yes, I've heard this many, many times, so who doesn't uh, this? And the problem is also that uh, we are not the first ones and we've been trying for, uh, for decades to have a healthier and more sustainable food system. And the problem is that if you look at the environmental, socioeconomic and health consequences of our food system, we can say that things are not, are not looking great because our food system have a very significant environmental impact in terms of health, uh, diets are leading causes of non-communicable diseases. And then there are also socioeconomic issues in, in, our, in our food system. So the problem in this regard, it's also that we may almost uh, now be discourage in a way and see this healthier and more sustainable food system as a treasure that we cannot achieve because it's behind the gate that it's locked. And so it's really like, how can we, how can we achieve this, uh, this goal? And this is a little bit the, the starting point of these, of these policy chats and these webinars. And uh, the question is really, if we can't achieve this goal, if we can't uh, get to this, this treasure, could it be that also there is a problem in how we've been trying to, to open this, uh, this gate? And, and here it's like, do we have in this analogy, do we have another set of keys or are there any other options that we could, uh, we could explore? And here a necessary premise is that we are, we don't, we are not naive and in a way we are also not uh, uh, arrogant. So when I say we are not naive is that we recognize that the issues, especially at food system level, are really, uh, th there's a lot of issues. And so there are many different aspects that need to be considered. And so it's not that we, what we are proposing today, it's the solution or what we are proposing, it's like something that other people have not considered or that we pretend that we know that what, what we have to do or that this is the exact solution. This is the key to achieve the goal that we want to. We want to. But at the same time, what we want to do today is to stimulate a bit the thinking around these, uh, these topics and really to see that have we been discussing these topics in just a single way or in just in a matter? Are there topics that we have not considered that could be really, uh, that can really support our quest for a healthier and more sustainable food system? And this is why we started internally in, uh, in FIST, our, uh, our different policy chat. And here there is just a very brief overview of what we've been doing so far. And uh, most of those were uh, internal for our consortium. So we started with uh, sustainability and inequity, really to show what a systemic perspective to this, uh, to this topic entail. Then what does it mean to have a research in a political environment? Can we be a political? Is it how can we be political within a, a research context? And then we also try to analyze uh, um, the topics that uh, are more prevalent in the, in the debate. And so we have, uh, we debated about food security. We also debated about uh, the developments of the farm to fork strategy. And so these were all internal uh, debates. So we decided that since they were going well, or at least in my, in my brain, they, they, they did, we decided to go public and to try to show these, uh, uh, to share 
these uh, these views and these efforts with uh, with the community and to really again to try to stimulate the debate so well, i really hope that today it's gonna it's gonna be one of these and this is why we selected this uh, this topic and i'm also really glad because uh, in a way these previous ones it was just myself selecting a topic i was just presenting and we were discussing and so today you're we're more lucky because rather than myself you will have uh, four great uh, presenter discussing the um, the topics that are that are following and so in uh, in short we will start with the with the first great presenter that is my colleague uh, my colleague sofia that she will uh, talk about why we selected this uh, this topic so before we uh, move uh, to the presentation to Sofia's presentation. Just very few simple um, rules for today. So we decided to have just uh, three speakers after Sofia because we really wanted to take the time for the presentations and for the discussions. I think that uh, too often in these webinars we have a series of short and really too many presentations. They don't give the time to the presenters to express themselves, but also to the public, to the people, to really think about these topics and to really absorb what is, uh, what is discussed. So we will take this time. And uh, what is important is that uh, we are really, really glad that we had so many attendees. But at the same time, this means that we cannot have a, a public discussion, an open discussion where uh, people just um, raise their hands and uh, and talk and so he, what i ask you is that there is a q and a um, option so you can use that and you can write your question while the speakers are uh, are presenting and even after it will be it it isn't precisely but we will be around 20 minutes and 20 minutes so you can you can ask that we know that for some people the q and a doesn't work very well on teams so if that is the case don't worry you have the button on the, the chat so feel free to share it in the chat you can add your name uh, or you can also ask uh, ask anything i will try here as well to be as uh, democratic as possible to select as many questions as i can but of course if there will be will be many i will have to select a little bit the, these questions and so we we continue uh, with uh, with the presentation and it's also that uh, we we won't have a break in between and uh, of course we, it's it's a webinar so if you feel that you need to disconnect feel uh, feel free to do so and uh, and take your time and then we'll uh, we'll be here when you're um, when you're back and so this was the let's say the, the the presentation and then we will share the contacts also with all of you afterwards and um, so that's it for my side i hope you'll uh, all enjoy the the webinar and now i can uh, i can uh, leave the floor to you sofia thank you samuele uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sofia Romagosa, and I work as research officer at your health net. I'm also a colleague of uh, Samuele, and uh, I'm also uh, working on work packet seven and working on the all the policy work related to FIST. And today I'm going to give you just a little brief introduction on what we're talking about today, what are food cultures, and uh, why are we why do we really need to talk about food cultures and provide you a little bit of context uh, for what it's to come um, after in the presentation with the three speakers. So the first, the very first question is what what's really food culture? Maybe some of you are more familiar than others, but food cultures do refer to uh, the set of beliefs, the values and the practices around food. And it's about what we eat and how we prepare and how we consume our food. So it talk, it really explores the relationship that we as individuals have with food. How do we approach it? But it also examines the different cultural factors that uh, actually influence the food choices and the way we behave around uh, food. So it not only considers aspects of, for example, nutrition or of taste, but it also considers aspect that goes beyond those um, such as traditions and uh, social norms. And uh, also food cultures do reflect uh, cultural identity and uh, is a way of expressing, yes, identity and give uh, meaning through food. Um, something important uh, to consider about food culture is that it does not freeze in time. And in food culture does evolve, meaning that what we 
eat today and what we the way we prepare food it's actually quite different or it's likely that it's different from how it was one century ago and just to provide you like uh, an example the pizza which is um attached to it well it's part of the italian cuisine and attached to italian um identity and uh, there is a very interesting research from um, an italian historian called alberto grandi who actually um put out there some of the of the history of pizza and how for example uh in the 19th century was something completely different to what we think of the pizza of of today of the of the picture that you see here in the slides and in fact um the way like in the 19th century for example the pizza uh, it could only be found in very few cities in the south of italy it was actually sold as a street food had a completely different shape it was wrapped and it was actually consumed by uh, the lower classes. So the pizza that uh, that you see here in the picture, in the picture, and the way that we uh, conceive it today, it's actually the result of a, a migration process of some Italians that went uh, to the U.S. and uh, and after World War II uh, brought it back to Italy and popularized it. So this to say that. Um, the way we cook the food, it does change with time. And um, so then one of the questions that uh, we need to think is why do we really eat what we eat and why do we prepare and consume the food the way we do? And actually the result, it, um, it the res yeah, the answer to these questions are basically that it's an, it's the result of an, an interaction of uh, very complex interaction between multiple factors that you can see here in the in the slide starting with individual factors so we can think of more biologically related like uh, taste and hunger and satiety but then there are other individual factors that uh, relate more to intrapersonal drivers such as attitudes the beliefs the motivations that we might have or preference towards food and actually, these interpersonal drivers do actually develop throughout the life course of a person. And not only that, but are actually shaped by the social and environment, uh, the social and cultural environment. Uh, but then there are other factors that also play a role into uh, into this uh, formula, which are the physical setting. So, uh, for example, what food services uh, are around us, where we live, where we work, and in what food environments are we exposed to and what foods are around us. So that will also determine our food choices. Not only that, but then we also need to think of economic aspects, such as the price it is um, can we really afford certain foods, certain fruits, certain vegetables, or even the time? Do we really have the time to uh, cook a certain meal that might be more elaborated than maybe uh, others? And then there are other factors that are important as well uh, to consider when thinking of oh, how someone chooses uh, food or not. And it's, uh, it relates to the informational uh, environment, meaning the media and marketing and advertising uh, strategies and how, for example, uh, private companies could use this to influence our food choices. So, yeah, the what we eat and how we prepare is actually uh, the result of this um, complex interaction of these multiple factors that actually do influence the food choices and the way we behave around food. So um, when we think about promoting healthier and more sustainable diets, um, by adopting this food culture lens can provide us this holistic picture of complex societal structures and societal processes that do influence food choices and do influence our uh, food behaviors and that goes beyond individual determinants um, yeah individual determinants and uh, it also help us 
when thinking of designing and implementing interventions like food policies or policies in general that promote these healthy and sustainable diets. And we can do that by advocating for positive food cultures that do take into account this context and the social uh, context that we're talking about. So the social, the environmental and the different cultural factors. So adopting a food cultures lens can be very helpful for providing this holistic picture. But then also when we think about transitioning towards this uh, healthy and more sustainable diets, uh, linked to what my colleague Samuele uh, was presenting before, um, we want to also stimulate the debate and think of food cultures as one of these potential keys in the gates uh, towards this uh, transition and reflecting on how food cultures do change and that they are the result of historical processes. And we think that there is a need to further explore this evolving nature of food cultures. And by investigating this, we want to understand if actually food cultures do play an opportunity uh, for this transition to healthier and more sustainable diets, if they do play as an enabler for policy change, or maybe not, maybe they play and uh, they do prevent policy change. So I think it's important that we talk about it so we are able to understand their role and what role they play in, in the debate in food, uh, food policy uh, towards uh, this change. But then we believe that uh, by exploring uh, by exploring this, we can also uh, understand if there are some stakeholders that are able to influence more than others uh, food cultures, and that can be as well very interesting when we are uh, discussing about designing and implementing interventions uh, uh, towards healthier, more sustainable diets. Um, so hopefully this gave you an overall picture of what food cultures are and the reason why we're here and why it's important that we talk about this. And now we will go more in depth on how this developed and how do they shape food behavior. So we will have uh, three speakers today, three presentations. We will start with a presentation on food and nationalism, bringing a more of a historical perspective into the, um, into the webinar by Atsuko Ishiho. Then we will have another presentation on media strategies and how this influence people's perceptions around food cultures by Tim Smith. And uh, we will have a last uh, presentation by Lorenzo Bairatti on how food cultures influence food policies, bringing more of a legal perspective into the webinar. So I would like now to introduce the first speaker, Atsuko Shiho, who is a, an associate professor in the, um, in the Faculty of Business and Social Studies at Kingston uh, University. Uh, her field of study is uh, national studies and one of her specialization areas is food nationalism. So um, I would like to thank you, Ishiho. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing well your name. Uh, thanks for accepting our invitation and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much to start with for, um, for the FEAST um, project team for inviting me for, to this project. Um, webinar. I'm, I was really excited to uh, to be invited to discuss what I am um, I've been doing, especially with my colleague uh, colleague Yona Zanta. So what are we going to do today? Um, the webinar today is as we need to introduced is on the connection between food cultures and policy implementation and the specific focus is on the on the focus on influence customer nationalism and food industry except on food culture and my limit as I understand is to explore the relationship between nationalism and food system policies through a range of examples and so my aim today is to illustrate complex ways in which nationalism works in deference to food. And then we start with a selfless 
shameless self-promotion. Uh, what I'm going to present today, it's taken from the uh, from this book, Food Nationalism, oh, sorry, Food Na National Identity and Nationalism, which the second, second edition of which came out two years ago. Um, run out and I've been working on this this um, relationship between food and nationalism. And if you are interested in this particular topic, do have a look at this book because I think both of us managed to um, have a different dimensions, a variety of dimensions the, about the relationship between the nationalism food and say some of them might have you know, direct policy implications. Okay, let me, today I'll be focusing on the case of Japan and uh, the starting point is the, the inscription of Washoku onto UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list in December 2013. Washoku, it's literally translated in Japanese food or Japanese cuisine. And what it's inscribed onto the, the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity, it's entitled Washoku, the traditional, traditional dietary cultures of the, of the Japanese, notably for the celebration of the new year. Now, when it came out, it was such a, uh, such an, uh, cause lots of, um, uh, lots of attention. And in, before I move on to discuss this issue first, um, the idea of intangible cultural heritage, that's probably needs to be, um, explained a bit. It is otherwise known as living heritage. And according to UNESCO, it involves includes such things as oral tradition, performing arts, social practices, rituals, festive events, knowledge and practices comments concerning the concerning nature and the universe or knowledge and skills to produce traditional craft. And they say they that is UNESCO says it is in Cultural, intangible cultural heritage is important in, in the face of, in maintaining cultural diversity in the face of growing globalization. So the, the whole idea of inter, intangible cultural heritage has been kind of institutionalized. Um, there's a lot of debate about this, about kind of global north, global south, but also there is a kind of a, you know, underlying concern is that globalization is having a flattening uh, impact on human culture. And how does food or food culture comes in to this list? It was in 2010 that two elements related to food were introduced for the first time in the, into the, um, inter, in, tangible cultural heritage list. That was um, the gastronomic meals of the French and traditional Mexican cuisine. And as of the end of 2021, 25 food related elements are listed. And I believe since then, um, at least two, uh, Napolitanian pizza and the bolst have been added to the list. List. So if you look at the UNESCO's um, the list, the latest list, it, uh, the number of elements which are related to food or food culture should be near, near 30 rather than 25. When the washoku was inscribed to, onto the UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list, was it kind of a, the moment of um, gastro-nationalism? In a way, yes. As you can see in this kind of a coverage in the Japanese media, how, uh, how this the e event or incident was covered. And uh, on the left hand side, this uh, red one, it's, uh, it's a brief of a particular uh, program by the NHK, the Jap BBC equivalent in Japan. 
um, it says that the, the whole world is in, in, uh, is in the pride, the praise of Washoku, etc., etc. And on the, in the middle, this is a front page of Sankei Shinbun from the, um, 5th of December that 2013, um, reporting that the Washoku has been inscribed. And it focus, as you can see, the focus is very much kind of, this is what traditional Japanese food look like. And then this read, uh, Second read, read one, says that it ex Washoku expresses the spirit of the Japanese. So it is, um, it is about, uh, in, uh, so the, these coverage suggests that it was understood the inscription of Washoku in the intangible cultural heritage list was understood as that, the, as the global recognition of the importance or uniqueness of Japanese culture. Um, it's, you know, it's important, uniqueness and the importance and significance of Japanese identity and culture has been recognized, which can be used, of course, for aggressive national branding. However, if you look at the process behind the inscription of Washoku onto the UNESCO's list, the, Answer is actually no. It's not about cultural nationalism or, or aggressive uh, um, projection of it, the uniqueness and greatness and superiority of Japanese food onto the onto the world. The application was mainly driven by concern, worries, or even anxiety about Japanese traditional food, food culture, and the future of the Japanese nation. And this can be uh, evidenced by the introduction of so-called shokuiku in the early 2000 notice um, in Japan, and I'll come back to shokuiku later. And then this chap, this uh, Michelin star, uh, Kaiseki. Kaiseki is a form of a traditional Japanese queen thing, upmarket, very expensive. Um, he was the drive, really the driving force behind the, the application to the, for the inscription. And his concern was that, uh, unless we do something about it, Japanese traditional cuisine, washoku, especially kaiseki, um, would disappear. And he runs this, uh, near the upmarket restaurant called the Kikunoi in Kyoto, which is apparently super, super expensive. Um, it's not for mortals like me. Um, but if you have ever chance to go to Kyoto and have a bit of cash to spare, at the moment, Japanese saying it's very cheap, try that one. Now, shokuiku. Shokuiku, it literally means food and nurturing or food education, etc. According to MAF, that is Ministry of Agriculture, for Forestry and Fishery, Shokuiku it means food and nut uh, nutrition education or promotion. And two pieces of key legislation, uh, 2005 Basic Law of Shokuiku and 2008 School Health Law. So the idea is... Uh, in the early to early notice, Japanese government was sufficiently worried about the state of diet, Japanese diet, um, and especially among children. The legislation came through, came, was driven by the concern, um, such as school children skipping breakfast, children purchasing meals at a convenience store instead of eating with their parents, Families not eating meals together and the perceived decline of Japanese style diet, especially in the, in, in the form of rice consumption. Now, so shokuiku, it's very much about, you know, expression of the uh, policymakers worries, anxiety about the health of the nation and the family life or family ties in in Japan, which is related, which are somehow uh, linked 
to the to sharing food, eating together, as well as eating what Japan can produce. And this is a, these are two kind of ex excerpt from the guide to shokuiku from uh, uh, this is the English publication by Math 2012. Um, it says it has some reference to Japanese style, uh, Japanese style food life and eating locally. And the Japanese style food life, it says Japan's culture and the environment is suitable for producing rice to staple for staple dishes, fish meat and so on for main dishes and vegetables, seaweed, legumes, and so on for side dishes. These diverse ingredients combine in difficult, different ways to create our Japanese food life. Not only, are the, not only the foods from Japan nutritiously balanced, but eating them together provides a rich food life. This is all connecting to improve Japan's food self-sufficiency rate and continuing the food tradition of the local areas in Japan. Again, this concern about food sufficient food self-sufficiency rate, it's really low in Japan, um, family life, the health, etc., etc., and kind of eat. It's to me, it's like an expression of expression of organic, uh, organic nationalism, that we are what we eat. We, culti we eat, cultivate this soil, water, wind, etc., etc., kind of brings, you know, makes us as human beings. Um, so, sorry, I was getting into something else. And eating locally, this means eating uh, foods grown or caught and gathered in the area. Let's be aware of local of our local areas, food, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the concerns behind the, um, the inscription of the Obfashoku onto the UNESCO's list. And the decline in rice, rice consumption, the staple, the, which rice, as we have seen in the MAFS document, is meant to be the, the you know, most suitable uh, crop in, in the Japanese climate. Japanese-style diet has been declining, and this shows that apparently a few years ago uh, that most of the respondents to a particular survey said they eat only one rice for one, one meal a day. And when you look at the rice consumption in Japan in reference to, uh, to bread, in 2000, in 2000, the spending on rice was about 40,000 yen, Whereas uh, spending on food, uh, bread was uh, between 25,000 and 30,000 uh, yen. And, but by uh, 2017, rice consumption or spending on rice has dropped between 20,000 and 25,000 yen. Well, bread, spending on bread, has risen to between 25,000 and 30,000 30, yen. So obviously, people are not eating rice, and um, the uh, consumption of rice is going down. And obviously, what policymakers worried about that the rice consumption going down, and uh, therefore the traditional Japanese style diet it's it's declining, seems to be um, worn out. And this has been shown on the uh, rice farming in Japan. Japan used to maintain very strict um, control uh, control of rice production, distribution, and sales. However, in two, uh, 1994, rice system the, the system of government control rice production was abolished. This is to do with uh, um, does God agree? At that moment, still got um, Uruguay round, and et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, um, by then, the idea that the, the, the government has to control or maintain a strong you know, farm grip on the production of staple food, it's gone. 
In 2004, there was further liberalization of sales and distribution rights, and there is a shift in the policy of reducing acreage. This is a policy whereby the uh, farmers are encouraged to, to shift from rice cultivation to something else. So they were subsidized if they, they stop producing rice, but um, shifting to um, producing, I don't know, um, kind of vegetables, et cetera, et cetera, they would, have, they would get some um, subsidies. But in 2004, this policy was kind of a started one down, and 2018, this acreage reducing policy was, was terminated, and instead, producer-led uh, cultivation, sales, and distribution, uh, including diversification system, was put in place. And this has resulted in the, um, in the reduction in rice acreage and the stabilization of rice price. So here you can see that how the demand and supply works if government stops um, intervening. So um, demand is, has gone down, so therefore supply has gone down. And as a result, rice price has stabilized. So uh, if you put the inscription of Washoku in this context, it is it is, uh, from my point of view, it is a use of international scheme to, uh, to revive what is perceived to be a declining national culture. And basically, the, the whole thing seems to be asking for international support for the preservation of Japanese culture. So therefore, I don't, you know, it doesn't look like, a def uh, it doesn't look like an uh, aggressive projection of Japanese superiority or uh, greatness, etc. But it's more of a defensive move um, to asking, and this is a, kind of one of the um, characteristics of post-war Japanese policy. Um, they are good member, um, mem good member of international community. So therefore, they are asking international community for help to preserve their, their identity, their uniqueness, their culture. And so rather than it is a kind of aggressive self-promotion, it is much more about defensive move to try to preserve what they think important for themselves. However, although this they are not eating as much rice as before. Japanese still like um, rice. And um, when 10,000 people were asked, do you like rice? 77% of people said very much. This big one. 17% of people said somewhat. And for 4% of people, 4% of the respondent said neither. And 1.3% said not really. And only 0.1% of the respondents said they don't like rice at all. And anything Japanese style is very popular. Um, I spent a bit of time trying to figure to get this, uh, this photo from internet. So, sorry, I'm plagiarizing, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry about this. Um, yeah, as you can see, this probably, you know, you can make out this is a pasta dish. This is a Japanese style pasta dish. And um, why is it Japanese? Because it is, what is used there is lotus root, um, cotro, and, uh, uh, is it Japanese pasta? This course, shiso. Um, on top. And the, like consumption of pasta in Japan has grown considerably over the you know, 50 years or something. And there is a grow, uh, I'm not saying that the, the 
idea of Japanese style pasta sauce is solely responsible for the growth of pasta consumption in Japan, but obviously it contributes. And when you look at the recipe side, it is in, you can figure out what makes pasta this foreign item, clearly foreign item in Japanese cuisine, Japanese. And it is, it could be ingredients, and uh, in this case, soya sauce seems to be very important. If soya sauce is used, somehow it becomes Japanese. Seasonality, because it's spring, we will use um, um, rape um, flowers, etc. Or these uh, little um, wild vegetables which, which can come to the market in early spring. Um, because it's winter, uh, in order to mm, protect ourselves from, from cold, we use citrus. And the health benefits, uh, uh, light and vitamin C, etc., etc. These are the, uh, these are the reasons why a particular recipe becomes Japanese. And most of the time, the way it is explained why this particular recipe is Japanese correspond to general discourse on Japanese food, which is celebrated in UNESCO's inscription as well. And UNESCO's uh, inscription of washoku onto the UNESCO's list also inspired gastro-tourism and the number of foreign visitors eating what hit 32 million in 2019 and they to 4.1 million in 2020 for obvious reasons. And then it was recovered 25 million in 2023. And apparent you know, in this recovery, gastro gastronomy tourism seems to be one of the pillars by the, at least the Japanese um, tourism market to promote, to invite, incentivize inbound tourism. So um, before I conclude, I just want to mention something about well meat eating because when talking about Japanese food culture, this probably should, should be mentioned. Okay, white meal eating is always seen as and presented as cultural heritage of Japan. In December 2018, Japan withdrew from the International Convention of the Reg uh, Regulation of Whaling. And uh, when they withdrew, the Cabinet Chief Secretary issued a statement and towards the end of the statement, this has been said. In its long history, Japan has used whales not only as a source of protein, but also for a variety of other purposes. Engagement in whaling has been supporting local communities and thereby developed the life and the culture of using whales. Japan ha hopes that more countries will share the same position to promote, promote sustainable use of aquatic living resources based on scientific evidence, which will thereby be handed down to future generations. And then since, since the withdrawal from the treaty, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese whalers are engaged with whaling in Japanese territory waters and exclusive connect zones. The idea is that the uh, whaling and whale meat eating, not just eating whales, but using the all parts of a whale, but Japanese and a part of Japanese cultural heritage. However, the consumption of uh, whale meat in Japan has all but disappeared. Um, I said this is very clear. Um, in the, ninth, the peak of the consumption was between 1960s and 1970s, and this is when uh, yeah, okay, it was 70s, and as, you know, by the 1990s, it was almost negligible. So, uh, while, you know, Japan was still engaged with an uh, Atlantic whaling, et cetera, et cetera, um, people were not eating it, but it continued. 
Um, again, this shows well and in the importance, the decline of the importance of well meat consumption as a percentage of meat consumption as a source of protein. It was, it was very important source of protein, um, 60s and 70s, but then it just dis declined. And so it seems that the gastronationalism in wild meat it's, it is about contestation. It is about contestation against perceived cultural or ethical imposition that we shouldn't kill whales or we shouldn't eat whales because they are uh, intelligent or they are mammals. Um, so therefore, eating or making use of whales become, became cultural heritage of Japan. But it is not about kind of producing, uh, projecting aggress uh, image of Japan aggressively towards the world, um, but just saying that we are. Uh, it is. It becomes a question of cultural rights, etc. And by the way, the date six uh, invention in Japan, where government is really trying to increase the um, consumption of whale meat, is the spending machine. Um, if you have been to Japan ever, you have probably, you, you cannot fail to notice the uh, vending machines everywhere. And now the uh, whale meat products are sold in through, through vending machines, which probably means that uh, it is on the, on the last leg. Okay, so, um, what I've been trying to, to illustrate in this presentation is that the gastro nationalism can take various forms, can be state rate or bottom up, and it reflects how the world is perceived by certain actor at a certain point of time. And nationalism works in this context as the meaning giver. And obviously state power is important because they can mobilize a lot of Resource, but also commercial sector's involvement needs to be looked needs to be taken into account. And to put it simply, nationalism is complicated. It's not just about um, asserting one uh, one nation's superiority over others. It could be a very defensive way of trying to preserve what they they think they hold dear. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Asuka. That was uh, that was uh, very interesting. And uh, so I remind everyone that you can use the chat and the question and answers to ask any of your uh, of your questions. I will use a little bit my privileged position to start with the with the first question, and, and I find it um, really interesting. And it was uh, what we discussed when I, I um, asked you to be part of this uh, this webinar. In that, so why we the, the reason why we wanted to start as well with your presentation is, as I explained, the, the fact that we wanted to deconstruct a little bit this idea of food culture as something that has always been the same. This sort of I use the the image of of a stone rather than something that changes. Uh, mm -hmm continuously. And what I find really interesting in your presentation, it's really that uh, there seems to be an influence, but at the same time, it is a little bit as if food culture had a life on its own. So in a way, they don't reflect necessarily what, uh, it's not a deterministic aspect of a government wants to change a food culture and then they will have a certain, a certain uh, output. And so thinking about it's, uh, let's say, a little bit more as well uh, to, the, to the European context, and I know it's a a, a complex and maybe a bit naive question, but for us in our uh, in our work as well, do you think that there is something that we we could consider or that we could uh, stress more on the aspect of, for example, if we want a healthier uh, and more sustainable food system, or if we want to advocate for certain uh, food cultures, do you think that there is something we can do to steer this debate towards one direction, or is it completely out of our control in a way? I think there's a lot can be done. The 
the famous example of Mediterranean, Mediterranean style diet. Now it's uh, inscribed under the UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage, which I think 10 countries uh, sponsoring it, I think. Um, it, the, I, I think what do we, what I'm kind of thinking at the moment is this growing awareness of climate crisis seems to be feeding into slowly, slowly, um, maybe this is a bit kind of a middle class argument, um, people's consciousness. And I was, uh, I was looking at, uh, uh, I, was, I came across an, uh, um, work on the, on the uh, promotion of vegetarianism in Brazil, uh, based on this con this concern, not about the health concern, but the concern for the uh, climate, um, at least in the survey or this experiment, a high, a high proportion of people were ready to say, yes, I was switch to vegetarianism because that's good for the planet. So I think this normative approach can work. However, as I, I put it um, earlier, um, it's very much conditioned by all this as a socioeconomic uh, climate circumstances. So um, it's not straightforward, but I think there are ways of doing it. And the idea of um, health, food, um, health and food and um, happiness, it's, you need to be slightly careful in dealing with it because it can get into very kind of ethnically um, exclusive type of identification. But it's not that difficult to make a, a connection between, this is the soil our wheat is growing. This is the soil our tomatoes are grown. And this is the water our, our whiskey is, is made, etc. And uh, I think the I, caring for the environment and the caring for ourselves, health, can be, and the connection can, can be made relatively easily. And the, the challenge is not to turn into something really exclusive and you know, still open to the idea of, you know, we now have different people on this patch of, patch of land, but we are all together. So uh, that, I think, can be done. This is very interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, we have a, um, another question here, and it's, uh, do you see a link between the food nationalism and the gastro diplomacy that some countries actively engage in? Or should we consider gastro diplomacy as mere uh, public relations? And uh, um, for, like the example of Thailand. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, gastro -na nationalism. Um, I felt to, I was planning to convene a workshop two years ago on this topic. And one of the, um, the potential presentation was gastro diplomacy of North Korea. I am really, really uh, disappointed that I didn't manage to bring it in. But yes, um, Gastro diplomacy, it's probably more, um, it's probably making, you can make more sense of it in terms of international relations that uh, gastro diplomacy tends to be a, um, the, the weapons that are used by weaker states rather than the stronger states. Um, that's it. Have anything to do with food nationalism? Yes, they do. Unless um, it is very difficult to, to forge completely um, what is meant to be Thai um, cuisine or Italian cuisine, etc., without certain bases. Um, I know that the Italian government tried to introduce certain kind of a um, authentication scheme for Italian restaurants, and basically they gave up, I think. Thai government is one of the, the few governments which have been successful to a 
to a certain extent. Um, yes, this is, in some cases, nationalism as kind of cultural expression, uh, state, you know, pr the promotion of the state, um, as national branding, et cetera, et cetera, can come together, but not all the time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, do you, Anand, do you want to add another question? Uh, is, is there time or? or yeah, yeah, on? go ahead. We are still uh, one or two questions, and then we can move to Tim. Um, yeah, just just on 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 just on the back of Tim's question, what you were mentioning, Atsuko. Um, have you analyzed? Um, I guess the ups and downs of how politicians, individual politicians, actually use or do not use gastro nationalism to capture votes, um, and you know the the sort of power dynamics. So you mentioned that you know in some of the weaker countries, I mean you always have multiple parties sort of vying sure, for sure. power. So in these countries, do you see any specific types of of parties or politicians use or not use, and does it really help them get votes and capture power? No, I, uh, the short answer is no, I've never looked into particular political parties or particular individual uh, um, politicians. Um, but my guess is, is that uh, neo-Nazis love vegetarianism, even veganism, um, because it's relation, it's a kind of connotation with soil and blood kind of thing. So I would Yes, that right-wing leaning politicians tend to be more into um, kind of culinary nationalism, um, and they may be able to use it very well. Um, but no, uh, so that's my guess at the moment. Okay, we have one uh, final question and then we will uh, move to team. So this question is, I'm living in Norway and the, uh, sorry, if, uh, it's the Bokuse competition are very public all over media and it's important that Norwegian chefs do very well. Would that be okay. food nationalism? Oh, yes, I'm sure it is, it is. And if it involves, especially what, what I would be interested in is that, the, is it, what, do people, do the public concern uh, with whether Norwegian chef wins or what is presented as Norwegian food. I think th these are two different issues. Um, it's a presentation of Norwegian-ness in terms of in terms of food or is it the person, uh, the chef's um, nationality? And then you are t talking about two different kind of dimensions of nationalism. Um, be really interesting how you know, if we can really look into how you can kind of differentiate if you can differentiate these two dimensions 